Hey listeners, this is Ben, the Amateur Exegete, and you're listening to episode 39 of Bible Study for Amateurs. Today's episode is A Fourth Synoptic Gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are so similar to one another that they are routinely referred to as the Synoptic Gospels. The word synoptic just means seen together, and in the case of the first three Gospels, they see eye to eye on a host of matters. John's Gospel, on the other hand, is often considered to be independent of the Synoptics. It's easy to see why, just from a cursory reading. Many of the pericopes that you find in the synoptics you don't find in John, and vice versa. This has led many scholars to think that John had no knowledge of the synoptics, or, if he did, he chose to go a completely different way. The scholarly landscape, however, is changing, and a growing number of scholars are beginning to think that John not only knew the synoptics, but that he also used them when writing his gospel. Why do they think this? Mark Goodacre, a noted New Testament scholar from Duke University, offers a glimpse into why the conversation is shifting in an essay entitled Parallel Traditions or Parallel Gospels, John's Gospel as a Reimagining of Mark. Goodacre's piece appeared in the volume John's Transformation of Mark, edited by Eve Marie Becker, Helen Bond, and Katrin Williams, that was published in 2021. Goodacre begins by noting that the view that John knew the synoptics was commonplace among scholars, until about the middle of the 20th century. Then things changed, and the idea that John was independent came into full swing. Parallels between John and the synoptics could be explained by tradition, and the differences simply reflected John's ignorance of his gospel counterparts. But Goodacre explains that the appeal to tradition is problematic, particularly because it can explain, well, everything. As a sole explanatory factor, it has allowed great malleability, he writes. He doesn't downplay the significance of tradition, far from it, but he believes that, John's literary familiarity with the synoptics explains the data far more successfully than the view that the connections between them are due to swirling pools of parallel traditions that somehow floated into two independent gospel streams. And in the essay, Goodacre demonstrates this by moving from small details to larger ones. First up are minor verbal agreements. The kind, Goodacre contends, one often finds between John and the synoptics. For example, when Mark describes Jesus' prediction of Judas' betrayal in Mark chapter 14, verse 18, he says in the NRSV, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. Matthew uses Mark verbatim, dropping only the words, one who is eating with me. In John's version, the language is identical to that of Matthew, except he adds an extra truly. In Greek, there is a nine-word string that, in Goodacre's words, is diagnostic of literary familiarity. This is not an isolated example. Not only does Goodacre offer two additional pericopes as examples of John's familiarity with the synoptics, he notes that plenty of other texts serve as evidence of it. Following a look at these minor verbal agreements, Goodacre moves on to what he deems the clearest example of John becoming a fourth synoptic. In his version of Jesus' anointing, the fourth evangelist seems to have drawn from his synoptic counterparts. John shares with Mark and Matthew a cluster of motifs in a similarly structured pericope that features closer verbatim agreement, 
Goodacre writes. For example, in each of these three Gospels, the scene takes place in the city of Bethany, just before Passover. Additionally, in Mark chapter 14, verse 3, we read that, per the NRSV, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard. John's description of what the woman brings in John chapter 12, verse 3, is nearly identical to Mark's. He deletes the word alabaster and refers instead to how much perfume was used, a litron, or pound. These are just a few of the ways John becomes a fourth synoptic in this pericope. Goodacre takes note of a possible retort to this example. Perhaps the evangelists just used a similar structure and language because it was ready-made for them in tradition. To respond to that, he suggests looking at macro-similarities between the synoptics and John. For example, before their telling of the triumphal entry, both Mark and John spend around 60% of their material describing what Jesus said and did before that event. He also takes note of the fact that the hiddenness motif so prevalent in Mark can be found in John's Gospel as well. He is still, in John, a hidden Messiah, as evidenced by three things. The evangelist division of Jesus' audience into insiders and outsiders, Jesus' hiding from the crowds and others, and the importance of the resurrection as the turning point for the full revelation of Jesus' identity. Goodacre's case for John's knowledge and use of the synoptics is brief, but in many ways compelling and the volume in which his essay appears belongs on the shelf of anyone interested in the question of whether John knew the synoptics. I can't recommend it enough. That's all the time we've got this week. See you next time. And remember, in the words of Richard Elliott Friedman, one does not need to deny what is troubling about the Bible in order to pay respect to what is heartening. Thanks for listening.